I am unashamed. What about you? So, Dad, you said that there was a uh, person from Oklahoma that gave you some some Oklahoma wisdom yesterday. What, what did he say? What did he say to you? He just said, Mr. Robinson, just keep doing what you do. Keep being who you are. That's what he said. Keep, keep being who you are. And I'm like, well, that pretty well covers it. <laughs> just okay, just feel you being you. <laughs> so that voice you're hearing is Zach. Zach, welcome back to Unashamed Podcast. We're glad to have you, always. Good to be back. I missed the first episode from yesterday. I was get stuck up on a mountain with no cell phone coverage in the middle of the wilderness, but I made it out uh, alive. And well, you're we're back. glad you made it. Well, I basically yeah. the last podcast talked about our Miamu event, which was a three day venture. But I think we helped a lot of kids, and it was it was a positive thing. We're making the world a better place. But I think maybe Phil, I after it was over, had a good synopsis of that, or maybe it was Al, but on why do to do bad things happen and why does God allow that? And uh, one of y'all said, because it shows you through the power of God that anything is possible to overcome. I mean, when we read those verses that, I mean, God can take whatever the situation and make it better. With God, nothing is impossible. Exactly. Yeah, which is, I thought it was really rich, Jason, really good. I thought the podcast was excellent. If you haven't listened to it, go back and, and catch that for the listeners. So it's, it's interesting, Dad, that you said that about the guy from Oklahoma. I'm actually in Oklahoma uh, because uh, at least I are here for an event. But we decided to, my kids, my grandkids are out of school for a fall break. And so we brought the whole crew up here to Lake Eufaula, Oklahoma. And so I, I found this new word, and I don't know, I'm sure Zach knows about it. I don't know about Jace or Dad, but apparently I've been informed by my kids that what, what I'm doing right now, and it's interesting because as I'm speaking, I'm looking out a window at the lake and I see my grandkids down there fishing, which is, you know, really good at the end of your, you know, as you get closer to the end of your life, you enjoy little things like that. But they call this glamping. Are you familiar with the term glamping? Oh yeah, I live in Asheville, so Asheville area. We've got yeah, we've, we've got a lot of that up here. Yeah, Zach was giving us an update in mountain climbing, but uh, the, the, there's one hill in the state of Louisiana that's a little taller than every all the other hills. And it's in Claiborne <laughs> Paris, but I, all I have to tell y'all is it's not a very high hill, so there's no mountain climbing <laughs> going on down here. So that's kind of like a far. They actually, you been doing what? Climbing a mountain. I'm climbing a mountain. I'm down there losing. Yeah, Zach, saying, they, boy. They call it Mount Driscoll, and it, and if I'm not mistaken, it's about 725 or so feet high, and it's considered yeah. a mountain in Louisiana because it's bigger than a crawfish mound. I that's guess that's it. So we that we run sense. out of mountains a long time ago. So glamping is a form of camping involving accommodation and facilities more luxurious than those associated with traditional camping. So do you know what I call that? Embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, Zach, you introduced a word a few podcasts back called a uh, portmanteau. You remember the portmanteau when you take two things and combine them together, two words. Oh yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. It, it's glamorous camping and you're right, Jace. It's not, you know, traditional, like I never liked camping cause I didn't like sleeping on the ground. So I just thought camping wasn't for me because I thought, you know, my back. Well, the, I'm actually thankful that because this is a first in my life. This is the first time that I looked up a word that y'all used and I was glad that I didn't know what it was. Yeah, most people don't realize the particular area in Louisiana where we live and move and have our being. It's it's the water in close proximity where we live, it rises and falls on ev any given year up to 30 feet. That's where we live. The, you look at your yard <clears throat> and there's trees growing there. But if you look at the watermarks on the trees, you're like, whoa. I mean, it, it literally on any given year can rise or fall 30 
feet. That's a lot of water. And it happens on a regular basis. We're used to it, so. So what do you call that? How do you define that? Why would a person want to live in a place that's going to flood? Bloodline. 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 Now, I've been camping out for 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was difficult moving up here because you got to keep in mind that there's a good portion of Louisiana. You get down to New Orleans, it's below sea level. That's what and, I'm saying. You know, like, yeah, it's it's a, it's a different – it's a total different world. We got up here, and we were looking to buy a house, and I said, yeah, I want to live in the mountains. Well, every house that is in the mountains, you, your driveway is – I mean, it's on a – very very steep grade and being a flatlander it it was kind of scary i mean i didn't like i didn't like driving up there it made me nervous but now i've been here four years i mean we're used to it but when we first moved up here we so we settled down in the valley because we were we were a little afraid of of heights so you you come from louisiana where things below sea level up here our top peaks are probably six thousand feet which I, I mean, you go to like where mac owen our friend mac owen lives he's a he's living nine thousand feet above sea level yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty incredible. Not much backwater there. We get through all the high water stages because we all realize it's temporary. It's 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 a it's a mighty thing where water gets up thirty feet, but when it gets there, it it's still temporary. But it does change the way you come in and out of your your abode. You you walk across the high ground. And you go to your house. You, you you can't come to your house by vehicle, only by boat. So it just a, but it's temporary, and it all leaves, and and all the snakes go back with it. They come in the gators, the snakes, and all that. They they come in your yard. So we're used to seeing things that in water. It's in my yard. I mean, it you get used to it. I like it. Well, to answer Jace's question, why would you live there? It's here. Here is a trade-off that you get in Louisiana that you don't get in North Carolina. That's you, right. You don't get near the the wild game. There, there's some up here, but not. I mean, the fishing and the and the and the and the deer and the ducks and there's a lot of turkeys up here. But yeah. outside of that, I mean, the, the the deer the deer scene is very slim compared to corn-fed deer in Louisiana that eat, see eat everything off all this. from my hand. Where I'm seated right now, everything from right like that, there's about a couple thousand acres that we're roaming around on, and uh, some sometimes it's by boat, sometimes it's uh, by just walking, but uh, on foot or by boat, it just it's just something you deal with. So I got your boats. definition. We could invent a word of flamping. Because you're camping in a place that floods. That is correct. Not to be confused with glamping. You're flamping. I can walk out. I can walk out in my on my porch, and stop and look around. Right now, it's just dry, dry. But in a I, flood, you could swim out to your porch. Because I've done it. Yeah, that's you know. I that's think right. we invented a word. Yeah, flamping. I'm gonna look it. I'm gonna look it up. There are many, many months we've we've uh, <clears throat> functioned, and our boat, my all my boats, but the boat we were using is tied to my doorstep. It's tied right there. And it's I can just step off in it and take off. Hey, it's not a word. We just invented a word. What there you're you doing is flamping. You're camping flamping. in a flood zone. Yep. So so Jace, I'll tell you, I've camped. I've flamped. And now I've glamped, and glamping is better. Yeah. Well, it's because you have you have yuppie tendencies. Uh, you've always been the weird brother. Now, I've noticed that in the later stages of your life, you're beginning to let yourself go. But most of your life has consisted of wearing loafers and khakis and shaving on a regular basis, going to HOA meetings. That little hey, pond H-O-I. that's right behind your house when they made the subdivision where you scamper to, uh, does that little <laughs> pond flood occasionally? It floods occasionally, but Phil, most people wouldn't call where I live like in the city. It's 
It's a rural. It's outside the city limits. There are trees growing, which is the only reason I'm living there. Yeah. I do. I do have a gate. It's the yeah. high ground for that piece Privacy. of real estate. It's it's pretty high ground where you're living. And the Lord sent me a a present here in the last couple of weeks. I had a pine tree fall from my neighbor's yard across the pond because I just have a little nook. Yep. And it literally cut off access to the back end of where my my property butts up to. Blocked. So my neighbor said, we're so sorry that our tree fell across the pond onto your property. And there's like, do you want us to cut it or do you want to remove it? I was like, the last thing you want to do is get rid of that tree. I Leave said, that for the turtles. Yeah, for the turtles and the dog. I did see a bullfrog on it the other night when I was scouting to see a frog. Mm, there were. you go. But it's now, it, it's it's almost like a wall of protection. So be thankful sometimes. Well, Jay's, you know where I got the idea from glamping from, don't you? No. You. You, you told a story on the podcast about going to Israel and you were out there, and I said, well, wasn't that rough terrain? He said, oh, no. They had the nicest camp. Uh, the cat, uh, They brought everything with us and these tents, and we were living. They were having buffets. You described the well, most glamorous way to see Israel. And mm-hmm. so I thought, well, I just want to be my, my little brother, Jace, and go glamping. So it, was, it actually all came from you, you. You missed the point on that. The point was I wouldn't have done that. They did it so people like my wife would say, boy, this is awesome. I mean, if we're going to go camp out there, let's go camp out. But no, they brought tents and they had a bathroom, a potty, and they they had the meal catered. And I mean, there's, I mean, that we camped, we spent a night in the Negev desert. But I will admit that the night before the next uh, nation over, dropped some bombs within a mile from where we camped out. So considering that, we did have enough anxiety to (laughs) fuel the camp out (laughs) because at any moment we could blow up. So it kind of offset. If you're going to go out, you might as well do it as comfortably as possible. So that was a different situation now. Yeah. Oh, well, Good I point. just I, I just remembered it, and so I thought uh, that. No, I'd you did what you typical that. preachers do. You took an illustration out of context. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I old habits it's die it. hard. Old habits <laughs> die hard, don't they? <laughs> I, I like it's what Peter had to say about it. Listen to this: what Peter went to when he was describing how come? Where's this Jesus, y'all all waiting for? I mean, you know, you, you know, y'all all wait for you. you. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desire. They'll say, where is this coming, he promised? Where is Jesus? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But notice this. But they deliberately forget something. That long ago, and guess what he goes to? By God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and with water. He goes to water, boys. But by water also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By that same word, the present heavens and the earth, including where I live, are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Are you, Phil, are you trying to justify living in a flood zone? That's what Bible? I'm doing. <laughs> it just hit me. <laughs> Phil, I was like, like where, if yeah. this earth is going to catch Jesus, on huh? fire, this flood zone that I live in may come in handy. Hey, you what? basically want to be the last man standing. I'd rather have the water than the fire, but... So we're going to see. (laughs) (laughs) Let's take a break. One of the, obviously the highlights of of getting to do ministry is you get to do a lot of different kinds of ministry. And Lisa and I have been sort of focused on the uh, pro-life movement. As you know, we talk quite a bit here on the podcast 
uh, quite a bit about it. And uh, but you know we're all involved, we're all engaged. I mean Zach and Jace, you guys are doing more on the fostering and adopting side. We're doing more on the on the front end, trying to help women make better decisions. Uh, about their babies. And you have to have groups that can walk alongside you. And one of those groups is a group called 40 Days for Life. Uh, and they've been a, a good friend of the podcast and supported us in the past. And we've supported them as well. They have over a million volunteers uh, in a thousand cities. Uh, so they're fantastic. And they're really focusing on some of those, what we would call blue states, where you have a lot higher abortion rate. And uh, we're seeing a lot of great results. And so uh, we want to support these guys. We want to volunteer. We want Unashamed Nation to rise up and, and be a part of what they're doing. Uh, check out their locations, their podcast. They've got a free magazine. If you go to 40daysforlife.com, uh, they're going to keep you updated on exactly what's happening on the post row America abortion front. And, and we are winning some hearts and minds. So that's 40 days for life.com. 40 days for life.com. Check them out. But you, again, Jace, you did it. Your illustration of being bombed made dad think, well, that's why I live in a flood zone, boys. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Well, I've learned a lot about you yes. today, Phil. Thanks. When he said, this is what Peter has to say about it, I was I, I didn't quite tie that together at first. I, I like, thought he was this going? going off from taking something out of context, but I wasn't sure. I thought I thought he I thought he was tired of the conversation and he just no, we're getting into the so I only bring that yeah. up to let our listeners know that what what is going on here is that when it comes to water, there was a big water, and this, and before it was, it was made, it was created, it was just a ball of water, and the waters receded, and up comes the dry ground. This thing started out, I mean, it was a planet. What's interesting is that they've looked over this cosmos with every kind of looking device you can have, and they keep sending them into outer space. They get away from planet Earth, and they're all looking for the same thing. You know what they're looking for, Al? Water. Water. They're looking for water, and you know how much they've come up with? Zero. Not one drop. It's Not worthy of note. a drop. Very worthy of note. They haven't seen a planet that's like Earth. No, three-fourths of it water? No. Nope. They haven't found that yet. Kind of makes you feel special, huh? It makes me say... These texts in the Bible describe the whole thing, where it came from, how it got here. No, I agree. So, Dad, you got a planet on one side that's red dirt. You can't live there. You got one. You got Jupiter down there. It's all gas. You can't live on that either. So nope. you got to have water to live, and which I is mean, why the and, Earth is. And, and this planet has a lot of it. That's not by accident. That's exactly right. So we're going to get back to the book of Mark, Jays. Hey, I'm, I'm a you fellas. <laughs> we we left off at Mark six, uh, just as a as a reminder, and uh, we had talked about the last time we talked about Mark. We talked about Jesus going back to his hometown of Nazareth, and basically not being accepted there as a result of just being what did he say, Jays? Too well known or too. You know, if I, most of the sermons you, you hear from uh, Mark six are talking about people who are raised in in church, and it's like the familiarity issue. I mean, it's like they couldn't recognize Jesus because he was from there. Well, he can't be supernatural because he's from here. It, it's oh, we he's a carpenter. It. I mean, I do find that fascinating. And then Jesus said, only in his hometown among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And they just... The whole, the first eight chapters, it's who Jesus is. That's what it's about. And his great power with all the miracles and all that. And it's, we're fast coming up on Mark chapter 8, whereby the first thing ever that he's said this he, first time this information is given, he then began to teach them, chapter 8, when we get there in the next couple of chapters, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. That's a big event. And that he must be killed after three days rise again. 
he, he spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside to say, no way. But Peter was wrong. That's exactly what he did. So, but it's interesting that eight chapters go by in the book of Mark. There's not but 16 chapters in it. And half of it, he never got to that until you get to Mark 8, verse 31. The reason he came, the reason he was there is unveiled to him. And that's exactly what happened. Just what he said. They, they came together and the Jews came together and they said, let's kill him and get rid of him. And that turned out to be the greatest news ever for mankind. Pretty interesting. Well, I think where we're at is interesting in that, you know, we, we talked about Jesus sending out the 12 and he yep. gives them this power. He introduces this idea that God is going to use human beings, despite their flaws, to show the world his power. That's right. And so what's interesting is if you read the last verse of where he chose his disciples for this special purpose, because then he, you know, then he calls them apostles later on, which is ones who have been sent out. He has a story within a story because if you read Hebrews, I mean Hebrews, if you read Mark 6, 12 and 13, so he sends his disciples out. They went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people yep. with oil and healed them, which is an added amendment there where Jesus would just heal them by his word. Of course, he's the son of God. But the disciples had to, or, or you know, they anointed people with oil, which, by the way, is still done today. We still as do far it. As praying for healing. So, and then he just picks it up in verse 30. So if you skip the story in, in between, it just says the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. But Mark, like he does in many other chapters, he inserts a story within this story and it's a gruesome story because it's John the Baptist being beheaded. And I don't think it's an accident because here they're sent out and they're feeling pretty good about this power. And then all of a sudden there's a reminder here that some people that God has a job for, it may not necessarily turn out well from looking at the perspective of this life because this is a gruesome, graphic depiction of what happened to the forerunner for Jesus, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Yep. When it is, it's interesting, Jace, that <clears throat> they put it in the context of, because the first three verses, and I'll just read them 14 through 16, is in response to what's going on. In other words, it says King Herod heard about this, heard about what that Jesus had sent out the 12. And so now it's more than just one guy. It's 12 that are going out and doing these miracles uh, because for Jesus had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. So this, what we're about to read has already happened. But when King Herod hears this, it it's, makes him nervous because he thinks he's been resurrected. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. This is what King Herod thinks. Others said he is Elijah and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard about this, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. So I did th find it interesting that the context of what was happening with the miracles and the apostles and all that makes old Herod who thought John was gone, has come back. And so it, it makes, seems to be even more of a threat to him when he realizes that this is some sort of, sort of spirit like Elijah that keeps coming back, and now it's in Jesus. That was his thought process. And it wasn't right, but that's what he thought. Let's take another break. Jace, we got big news. You like big news, don't you? Lay it on me. All right, The Chosen Season 3 is going to be in theaters 
November the 18th. They're going to roll out in the first couple episodes in the theater for people to watch. What do you think about that? That is one of the most exciting things I've ever heard. I mean, look, I've already gone in and looked at some of the filming sessions from afar. And, uh, of course, Missy cried the whole time. So so this season, uh, they're, they're saying this season, Jace, is the most consequential and emotional chapter yet. It picks up right where season two left off, but it sort of turns up the heat. Uh, Jesus' most famous sermon in history is going to be a part of this. Uh, both followers and enemies of Jesus are going to multiply, but it's also going to bring some new trouble, some new tension. But of course, we know that Jesus is going to bring us some rest. So if you want to see episodes one and two, they're going to begin in theaters starting November 18th. And then the episodes will start releasing for free in the Chosen app before Christmas. So if you want more information, visit thechosentickets.com. That's chosentickets.com. Uh, we love the chosen, uh, unashamed nation. You're the, you're the ones that told us about it to begin with. Uh, and we want to support these guys. It's going to be a fantastic season. So check it out. Yeah, it is interesting to me. It is interesting to me that, um, you guys were talking, talking earlier about, you know, the problem of evil and why does bad things happen to good people? And, um, yeah, this is an interesting text on, on that topic because you have, the disciples, the 12 that are being sent out and they received this authority, which I'm sure they were excited about to some degree or another. But if you notice what Jesus instructs them when he, when he sends them out, he tells them, he says, um, take nothing for their journey, except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. Um, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. Like, the, the, you know, don't, don't bring extra with you. And he said to them, wherever you, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the town, any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out, shake the dust from your feet and, and move on. But, but I love how Jesus sets them up where basically he's saying like, you're, you're going to be completely reliant on my authority and the power that I've given you. And, and you're not, you're not planning the trip. You're not, you don't have reserves. You don't have any of this stuff and you're going out and here's what you're going to tell people. You're going to tell people to repent which is probably not going to be a very popular message because that's the same message that John the Baptist started this whole entire uh, gospel with, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then the very next part, as Jace brought up, is a guy who followed the Lord. He followed God with everything that he had and with a message to repent. And, and his ultimate fate was that, that he was murdered. And I think that's important because sometimes we follow God and we follow Christ and we don't receive this was what Hebrew, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11. We don't receive the promise and we're not going to receive it until the end. And so one of the biggest comforts for me in dealing with like the problem of pain or why do bad things happen to me? Why do bad things happen to John the Baptist? I mean, the big answer is, is that God has a vantage point that's so much bigger than our own. We are finite creatures that occupy a particular space on planet Earth at a particular time in history. And so what we can see is so limited to the grand scheme, what we would call the scheme of redemption that God is unfolding throughout history. John the Baptist played a huge pivotal part in the coming of the kingdom. And yeah, he died. And that was probably very painful for him and his family. But in the grand scheme of things, greater is his reward in heaven. John the Baptist will receive the promise with us, along with all the other patriarchs that have died for the sake of Christ, we're all going to receive this promise one day. So vantage point to me is a, is a big picture here of what, of what's unfolding in, in the gospel of Mark. And, and it's a great point. And better than that, therefore you get to a uh, second Corinthians chapter four, all of us. Now the kingdom came, Peter brought it in like a hurricane. He reminded the Jews why that they had killed Jesus, the author of our faith and all that. And they said, what do we do? He told them to repent and be baptized. If anyone is in Christ, here's our job that came out of, we were looking at it when the kingdom was near. We're looking at it when the kingdom came. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. All this is from God who reconciled him to us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against us. And here's a, a, a terrific verse. It's not like the people weren't there to carry on what Jesus started. He's committed to us, his people, the kingdom, the message of reconciliation. It's now in our hands. And therefore, Christ ambassadors, we're Christ ambassadors. He picked 12 to begin it, but now everybody is given his spirit when they obey the gospel. As Peter said in Acts 2, God is making his appeal through us. So we still have a monster job ahead of us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are and we want you to be. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's all going to be worked out in the book of Mark through the apostles so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, as fellow workers, I urge you to receive, not receive God's grace in vain. So now he's still working through his people, possibly not as quite on the miraculous side of it, but just the information on who Jesus is and how to be saved is really not rocket science. He's the one that you read about in Mark that is beyond anything you can wrap your head around, Jesus Christ. And now we have a job to do. We represent him, and we're his ambassadors. We point people to him. We're doing it right now as we're seated here to our listeners across the earth. We're reaching a lot of people. You say we're simply just doing our job. Pretty cool. Yeah, and I do think something in here that, you know, King Herod comes up, and so he had an active role in not only John the Baptist being killed, but later is going to have a role in Jesus being crucified also, which is, I think, another reason this comes up. But it what made me think when I first read this is, you had him even questioning the laws of nature over trying to explain how these miracles are occurring. And obviously his guilty conscience was involved because mm -hmm. as we continue to read the story, he actually respected John the Baptist to a certain degree because he was a holy great man and he feared the people that followed him. But you actually see this grim, grim event that happens over someone trying to please important people. And he got caught in a, a situation where he would rather behead a, a noble man, a man of character, than not please the people around him. I mean, it, it was it's an awful very price. troubling. It's an awful price to be paid. Yeah, and I, look, I'm telling you, this, the spirit of this still goes on in our world. I mean, you're talking about lessons on peer pressure and trying to impress people in, yep. in these situations. We see it every day, Jace. Every day. Let's take a break. So we're glad that this podcast is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. Uh, they've been great uh, partners with us, especially talking about, you know, when times get tough. Uh, there's no doubt that, you know, life is full of twists and turns uh, and you need people to, you know, kind of help be a guide along the way. Uh, Faithful Counseling provides that. Uh, they have licensed professional therapists uh, who are Christians, who are believers, which is very important. And so uh, it's something to be done online, uh, which is a great blessing. Uh, I mean, I've I've been to counseling before, so as Lisa, uh, I think most of us have either counseled others or been in counseling. So we know what these uh, folks can do uh, to really help. So you can log into the account anytime, uh, send a message to your counselor. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. You don't have to be on camera uh, if you don't want to be. Uh, they match you with a, a counselor that's going to fit for you. Uh, so we'll encourage you if you're having a tough time, maybe something in your family, maybe something in your own personal life. Check these guys out. Visit FaithfulCounseling.com slash unashamed. Get the professional faith-based counseling that you deserve. They even got, they even have a special offer for uh, unashamed listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at FaithfulCounseling.com slash unashamed. And we just want to say thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, let me let me read it because I, I think you're right, Jace. It, it's a troubling uh, thing that happens, and you think about it. John the Baptist wasn't perfect, but he was a very upright man. He had he had taken a Nazarite vow. He you know knew his role to be the forerunner to point people to Jesus, and he died uh, a martyr's death. And he's really the first one for this to happen to. You know, obviously it's going to happen to a lot of them post Jesus. But let me read the story. And then we can unpack it in verse 17. So Mark cha- is kind of what, a what chapter um, six, Mark six. six. Yep. And uh, it's kind of a parenthetical because like Jay said, he talks about the 12 and then Mark comments of what Herod was thinking. And now he's just going to kind of break in and give us the story of what happens. This is breaking news uh, for Mark. It says for Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested and he had him bound and put in prison. And and I'll make one thought here. You know, we, I think it's John's account in the Jace where, you know, John the Baptist. When this happens, he he questions. Like he sends word to Jesus, like, or, or, or you you are the one, right? I mean, this this what we're doing here is the right thing. So he kind of has some questions, well, especially he did when this your head of, is involved. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> he he did this because of Herodias his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. So this, you know, Herod had married his brother's wife, which is obviously not, you know, he shouldn't have done this under the law. And if, Al, if, let me jump in. Let me jump in and just say, if you do a history on the Herodian Empire, I mean, they were very uh, vile and uh, explicit in their decision-making. I mean, they when it came to... Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So you we, think we have a little taste of the Herodian culture in these United States of America? Very possible, Phil. Well, go ahead, huh? Yeah, it was a very hedonistic, Jace, is what they were. You're exactly right. Verse 19, so Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. Before we think, you know, Herod was a good guy, that was basically because it was a threat to him politically. He thought, if I do something John the Baptist, the people are going to turn on me. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Kind of reminds me of Festus and Acts, the end of Acts with Paul. In verse 21, finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. So he's got all these important people from the region. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. So this is the the old lascivious, uh, you know, dance, I suppose. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, which is very big deal. Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Now, this is over one dance. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Because it's all about politics. The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. Man, that's brutal. And the reason that they did it was because she nursed a grudge because he said the right thing. What he said was right. He shouldn't have taken his brother's wife. And what gets me yeah. about it, I guess, is is the politics of it, but also just the this woman was willing to use her daughter in such a way. I mean, just think about how many bad things well, yeah. are present in this story. Well, most people, if you would never use your daughter. If you saw your daughter dancing sexually suggestively in a setting where there here's all these powerful men that would never be a positive thing but it just shows you how people in power and in government they 
they give up their morality for that power and they're indulging in all this sinful activity and it starts changing, you know, how you view what's right and wrong. And because you got to remember, what do people in, in governments in powerful positions, they surround themselves with yes men. And so here, John the Baptist. That still goes on. Yeah, exactly. That was the, the picture I was painting. And even Al, I did some research when he made that statement about, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. But actually, the way their setup was, they had broken uh, the territory into, into four quadrants. So that he actually could, didn't have the authority to do that. So he's basically embellishing what he actually can do. He's kind of caught up in the, in the moment of the dance. Which is what politicians do. Yeah. You know, and uh, he's wanting to please these men around him to his benefit. They're powerful people. He's using whatever means necessary, including his family, and, and just things that make you should feel queasy about. To the rank I mean, and file center going on in these within the echelons of politics, Jace, I mean, not much has changed. Well, that's what I see from, let's face it, people will do a lot of things for power, including you, you live in, in ways that are, that are nauseating because you use whatever means necessary to maintain power and control. That's it. And it tends to, to change your view of morality. They will rail against you if you introduce Jesus into the mix. You fast forward to our culture now, and you see the same things happening. I mean, even, you know, whether it's questioning what defines a male and a female or what is, you know, life. Who you have sex with. Yeah, there you go. I mean, and it just seems to go down that road in the name of power. Yep. Let's, uh, Let's take a break. No, and I think you're exactly right, Jason. One of the things that you see that happens here, and and you see it throughout the Bible, every time you run across something evil, a lot of the commentaries that I read about this scenario went back actually to Elijah. When you think about Ahab and Jezebel at the time, which is the king and queen, and they had it in for him. And they were the whole time they were trying to kill him. Remember, God was taking him out in three years. He was out in the desert. There was all this protection that happened as a result of it. And it got so much to Elijah. Well, you remember John the Baptist is in the spirit of Elijah. And I say that in quotes, he was his own man, but he had the same sort of spirit from God. And you see these powerful people that think that they can subdue God and, and they, and they're willing to throw their family under the bus. They're willing to throw anybody on the bus to get what they thirst most for. And that's power. And so just, you, you described it beautifully when this guy is just, he's drunk. He doesn't have the authority to give her what he said he was, because you're right. There were four different sons that had four different parts of the kingdom. And yet in that moment, the one who suffers is the guy that's in jail for protection, supposedly. uh, So this wouldn't happen to him that he's going to wind up losing his head over the deal. And all he did was say what was right and do the right thing. All these people that were watching, watching the dance out and, and, and what's going on there. I figured that had got into the wine a little bit. What do you think? Uh, that was probably the least, uh, the least thing they were into. But you know, even Jesus made that connection in Matthew eleven of John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. But I do think there was a greater picture involved here that by acknowledging that he had chosen these twelve, and then marked by telling this story, you got to remember this is a road. They're all. Well, for the most part, except John, I guess. And he was threatened and beaten. And they're all going to walk down this road. All, all the guys who were just chosen are going down this same path because of their declaration that Jesus is Lord. They're going to be martyred. And so I think you remember as God coming to earth, he allows time for human beings to wrap their head around the awesomeness of God and the bigger picture which is why when people use the argument to us who are not believers that, well, I can't follow Jesus because you can't explain why bad things happen. And w- w- that doesn't bother us because we know from stories like this, you're viewing everything about this life. 
but we're we're stating that the creator of the universe came here and he conquered the grave. What you're viewing as a problem is not a problem. We're thinking eternity well, here. Well, yeah, well, and and too when when they th- this is how big our God is when they when they ask us or someone says I, I can't believe in God because bad things are happening to people. We we then could say well what what how do you define what is bad? How do you define what is good? And and almost every time what they're gonna what they're gonna do and that and their their definition of good and bad is they're going to appeal to the divine realm. They're going to appeal to, you know, why is life valuable? If, if all that exists is the material world and all we are is matter, then, then, then nothing matters. But, that, but stuff does matter, and we know that it matters because we know that, that there's something that gives us value or someone that gives us value. So even the very stating of, the, of that dilemma, you're actually testifying that God is there because you are, you're acknowledging that there is a good and a bad that is objectively true. It's not a subjective interpretation that we would have of it. But I, I think that uh, the point you made, Jace, is worthy of note and, and worthy to repeat that every one of these apostles, except for John, would end up dying a martyr's death. And, and I think about that a lot because I think about in our culture, you know, persecution is, I mean, it transcends culture. And, and you can be persecuted in, in, in the United States of America, not to this extreme right now. And that's, I mean, that's just true. But man, I think to myself, how often am, am I fearful? I'm, fe- I'm, I'm afraid of just being marginalized. I'm afraid of just being made fun of, much less losing my life. But, but I really believe that if you're going to, you know, live the calling of Jesus, like this is one of the things when He says you got to take up your cross and follow Me, you have to be willing to lay down your life. And um, I think it would then this day and time, every one of these guys was going to uh, suffer the same fate as John the Baptist, the one who, who kind of paved the way for Jesus to come. No, I think it's you know, a valid I point. I want to jump in and say, because really, in a practical way, especially in the teenage years of our lives, we all have this moment because we are basically at that age trying to form the the crew we're going to run with. And I think in this moment, you always see that if you want to side with those who don't put their faith and trust in God, you're going to have to betray your morality. Yep. It, it, they're going to bring it to a head. And I mean, even I look back at my own life. I just thought when I put my faith and trust in Jesus at 14, I just thought, well, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm just going to ignore my friends. I'm not going to bring it up, but I'm just not going to do what they do. And, but it didn't work that way. Because they, they're the ones that forced the issue in a public way because it bothered them that I was not doing what they were doing. So they brought it to a head and said, yeah. what is wrong with you? Yeah. Well, I had to have this moment where am I going to come out there and state what I believe or am I going to do what they want to? Because we can't continue being friends and going where we're going. It, it just came to a Plus, to the woman that did the dancing, when asked, you know, if you can have anything you want. What do you want? Well, you wouldn't think some king would say, i tell you what I, you know, you tell me. And she said, i tell you what I want, the head of this John the Baptist on a platter. Yeah. That's a pretty bold request. And he did it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how far, that's how far to reach. Yeah, here, here's a piece of advice for those who are listening. If if you want to ensure that you never lose your life for something like this, just don't be a threat. Do not threaten the power structure that that, mm-hmm. that, that runs the world. And I, and I think about that because if you want to if you want to live a life where you're not threat, the reason why John the Baptist was killed is because he was a threat and he was effective. And and the same thing with the apostles. The reason why the apostles all died a martyr's death is because they were threats. They were a threat to the power structure. And the same thing today goes, like if you're a threat, and you will be a threat, if, if, if you're acknowledging Jesus and proclaiming him, like like Jace, like you said, you did at 14 years old. I had a young guy just this week. We were at an event with, uh, it was a, a woman's event we were serving at, but it, man, it was God was moving. And and the young guy looked at me and said, man, we need to, we need to have something like this for the men. I was like, yeah, we do. And he goes, it's going to be hard, though. It's going to be hard to get guys in here. And I was like, no, it's not. 
said, well, what do you mean? I said, men want Jesus. They just don't, they don't know it yet. Well, and right. for me, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think when I get in a conversation with somebody, I'm not thinking, well, they're not going to want what I got. I'm thinking they want what I have. Well, and, and there's a power yeah. there. And to clarify my story, look, I tried the defense for two years. Didn't work. I get to 16 and I finally spoke up about Jesus. I'd love to tell you that everybody patted me on the back and said, great, but they ridiculed, persecuted, and detached themselves from my presence. Jace, you saw a guy come in your living room, and first he put banner with you, said, you really expect us to believe that you didn't have sex with your girlfriend before you married her? Well, yeah. You really think we're that dumb? Well, the opposition was there, but what I wanted to say— And then the next question was, to me— do you believe homosexual behavior is a sin? Yeah. I quoted 1 Corinthians 7 that says it is, and look what they did to me. That, well, that's what threats, you know, they, they were ready to kill me. Well, that's what I was saying, <laughs> but what I was going to say was, you know, this led to a point once I started sharing Jesus, I didn't stop it at 16, even though it was really a tough opposition, but it actually led to a, a study with a guy who threatened in a threatened me in a physical way, and I actually just got whooped. And it's the only fight I was ever in that I didn't fight back. Thousands but, of people have been converted since the time you were asked. You know, do you think you know, right. waiting till you're married and having sex that's the way you ought to do it? I mean, thousands. And then the question to me: thousands have been converted because of that. Yeah. But what I was going to say was, is when I shared Jesus with this guy, and I've shared this story before, and there was a girl involved, and there was different things, but it didn't get violent until I brought up Jesus. Because then it was like, well, wait a minute here. You're telling me, well, what if I hit you in the face? I said, well, in this case, I'm going to turn the other cheek because I don't know you, and I'm sharing Jesus with you, and I'm not getting off of I, I don't want to fight you. I, I want you to respond to Jesus. And, well, it, it wound up, you know, him physically assaulting me. I thought he's going to kill me. And a couple weeks later, the same fella comes to our church assembly and decides to put his faith and trust in Jesus. The guy would later on fly me to various events to share Jesus. And four days ago, I literally treasure hunted his yard. And, and, and so I say all that, that was a span of, what, over 30 years. But it doesn't change that in that moment when this guy's throwing haymakers at me, I have to admit, I wasn't feeling warm and fuzzy about my faith in Jesus, you know, because I thought... Well, I had one with. stand over me and said, so are you telling me I'm supposed to forgive somebody who does wrong, does me wrong? I said, yeah. So he said, well, so he got up, came over to me, and he doubled up his fist. He said, well, what if I put this right between your eyes, my fist, you going to forgive me? And he was just standing there ready to do it. I, my answer was, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> but you're being honest, Phil. He didn't hit you're me. You're being honest. He didn't hit me, but I told him, forgive you, love your enemies. And he said, so what if I, and he got up and walked over to me. I put this up right between your eyes. I said, I will try. <laughs> that's a good that's a good response i, I think Dad, that's, a good, that's a perfect way to end the podcast because i think that your response was the humanity we all share we want to do yep. the right thing but we're honest enough to say we're human beings right that's right and th and that's what we're trying to do so uh we're out of time uh we'd love for you to follow us over to overtime uh, that's blaze tv.com slash unashamed and you can get ten dollars off if you use the promo code phil so we'll save you a little bit of money right now uh to to subscribe you don't get just our overtime uh comments but you also get everything that blaze tv has to offer so it's blaze tv.com slash unashamed use the code phil for ten dollars off we'll see you on the other side thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast help us out by rating us on itunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.